Hey folks, Riley Holland here with Hermiotti's Body Works, and I'm here today with Robert Grossman, the wellness business systematologist and founder of Wellness Prosperity Systems. How are you doing today, Robert? I'm fine, Riley. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. Great. Good to have you. So Robert helps healers and people in the wellness field with building systems around business and marketing. And as one of his elite coaching clients, I can say without a doubt that I've learned pretty much everything I know of value about business and marketing from Robert. Like I think is often the case with people whose passion is based on something like wellness, I had a huge blind spot when it came to the business side of things. Even the word marketing made me think of a kind of Super Bowl commercial spectacle, so I just kind of shied away from it. But of course, when it came time to build my own business around my passion, I had to realize that people weren't just going to come knocking down my door, and I was going to have to figure this stuff out. So I searched around a lot, and I ended up in a lot of dead ends. You know, there are a lot of people out there who want to give you business and marketing advice, especially online, but so many of them are so general you finally realize they're giving you the same advice they'd be giving someone who's selling pet rocks. Once I started working with Robert, I realized right away that he doesn't just understand business, he understands wellness. And this is a result of his unique background. He's got as wide-reaching experience as anyone out there, and I bet he's the only person on the planet who's been on this specific journey. Robert spent years as a top management consultant for the number one management consulting company in the world, and later became director of group strategic planning and market research for Deutsche Telekom, and then director of country transformation for emerging markets for Cisco Systems, where he advised governments of 130 countries on how to improve education, healthcare, economic development, and national security. Eventually, Robert found himself suffering from a debilitating illness, and he wasn't able to continue with this kind of high-stress work. So he went full-time into exploring wellness basically out of necessity, but eventually out of a passion for stuff like yoga, Vipassana meditation, nutritional therapies, medicinal herbs, and not as a tourist, I might add. Robert and I have talked a lot about these things, and he's definitely gone deep into them. Now, eventually, this search culminated when Robert met an ayahuasca shaman from the Shuar tribe of Ecuador and became his ceremony coordinator and apprentice. For two years, Robert worked with the shaman and received initiation into the ancient medicine ceremonies of the Shuar tradition and organized ceremonies in Europe, sharing that work with almost 200 people. Now he's returning from the wilderness, so to speak, with wellness prosperity systems, ready to share this amazingly unique perspective and skill set with healers and wellness business people all over the world. And I, for one, am very grateful for it. So, Robert, I want to talk about all of these pieces as well as how they intertwine and interweave and come together and what you're doing now with Wellness Prosperity Systems. But let's start out at the beginning. So you spent more than 20 years at a very high level in the world of big business and big government. What are the biggest lessons that you learned during that time? Two decades is enough time for a lot of lessons. So I want to focus on three different areas of learning I went through. First of all, specific tools and methods of business. I want to talk about the structure, the big picture of business. And finally, I want to talk about something I discovered, a dysfunction that's rooted in the structure of how we do business in our culture. So let's begin with tools and methods, because that's easiest. And to tell you about that, I want to go back to the years I spent at McKinsey. When I joined McKinsey, the firm was basically a legend in my mind. It was a team of master problem solvers. They get brought in to solve the toughest business problems, the ones no one else can solve. McKinsey teams get paid to deliver breakthroughs. It's a team environment with an apprenticeship model for learning. So I got to learn from master problem solvers. These are guys who constantly go into new businesses and they show the old timers there how to do things differently to get real results. And I'm not really talking about specific technical tricks or very advanced strategies. Honestly, the most powerful thing they taught me was how to use the simplest first principles of logic and common sense. It's all about going back to basics making complex things simple, cutting through the politics, cutting through the compromises and all the other BS and getting back to the heart of the matter, figuring out what is the actual purpose and lining up all the activity, all the processes and systems behind that purpose. These are simple, simple methods, but I use them every day. I find these simple methods deliver extraordinary results, and very few people ever go back to these simple basics. 
Now let me talk briefly about the structure and the big picture of business because it leads right into the dysfunction that I want to discuss. Most people spend their careers, or at least years at a time, working in specific functional areas. For example, a sales guy works in sales, a finance guy works in finance, and so on. But that's not how it works for a generalist business consultant. I worked in every functional area. Sales, finance, accounting, marketing, legal, advertising, HR, purchasing, the CEO's office, you name it, I spent at least a few months there. And when you have the chance to touch every single part of a business like that, you begin to see it differently. You start to see how all the pieces fit together, like a puzzle. I guess I began to develop a holistic picture of business. And that holistic perspective is what led me to begin to see the pattern of dysfunction that's built right into the way we do business in the modern world. You know, a lot of people feel the corporate world is somehow corrupt or untrustworthy. I mean, it's hard not to ask questions about what's going on. When you see golden parachutes for bankers, the pollution and destruction of the ecosystem of the planet, the food industry creating addictively delicious snacks that harm our bodies, there are so many examples of corporate greed, unbounded by any kind of ethics. No compassion, no common sense. And you know, what I saw from the inside was the organizations I was working for were incredibly powerful, but they constantly made destructive choices. Destructive for the world, destructive for their clients, even destructive for themselves. It can be a subtle thing. Sometimes it was obvious and sometimes you had to look really hard to see the destructive nature hidden behind seemingly rational corporate decisions. But the truth of the matter is, the power of the world is concentrated in these organizations, and they are not using that power wisely. So I began to ask, why? In fact, I became completely fascinated with this question. Whenever I worked with a new client, I'd ask. So I talked with senior executives and CEOs of huge corporations, heads of government agencies, I'd ask them, why did you choose this course of action when all your experts and even your own common sense told you in advance the consequences would be terrible? Well, they all said the same thing. They felt they had no choice. The system they were part of, these mega corporations and mega governments, the systems themselves were constraining their own leaders, forcing them to make choices they knew were wrong. These giant systems become more and more inward-looking over time, and their leaders are not really permitted to exercise freedom of choice. The system itself, the corporation, the government, the system itself has its own will. And the way we've designed them, most of these systems are completely empty of compassion, morality, gratitude, appreciation of beauty, or any of the other qualities we associate with wisdom. Wow, so it almost sounds like from having been brought in as a problem solver, basically as someone where they just say, hey, we got a problem, any problem, let's bring someone in to take a look at it, diagnose it, figure it out, that you actually ended up detecting a problem that was so deep in the structure of these corporations that it, it, couldn't, be, it couldn't be rooted out. Do you think that that's true? Do you think that that kind of problem is just inherent in the corporate structure? Or do you think it's something that could eventually be rooted out and, and transformed? That's a great question. One thing I've noticed is that even mentioning these issues in the big business world usually creates massive conflict and resistance. The people who are high up in these organizations normally do not want to talk about these deep-rooted problems. They're actually more interested in managing day-to-day -day operations. They want to hit the targets that have been set for them, and they want to collect their rewards. So, it seems unlikely that change is going to come from within. So the question is, can change come from without? Well, in the world of business, change from without usually means competition. And I do think there's a ray of hope in that area. The question is, can we create a new way of doing business? A way that's wise. A way that comes from the heart. It's no good if we try to build heart-centric businesses that are unsuccessful or unable to grow. We need to figure out how to create businesses that are capable of making wise choices and also being successful. And that is the heart of my work today. I want to build businesses that are good. 
Interesting. Well, I think that's good news for anybody who's uh, willing to see that kind of problem, but also who doesn't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. So I think that, that it's common for people to get so cynical about business in general, just because of the way certain businesses and big businesses are run, that they'll leave these principles behind altogether. I totally agree. For several years, I was one of those people. I was so disgusted with what I saw in the business world, I wanted nothing to do with it. I threw the baby out with the bathwater. Guilty as charged. But after a few years, I realized my mistake. And it's a huge mistake because literally the power of the world is in these businesses. So if you want to make a change on this planet, it's almost essential that you have the ability to somehow put what you do into the form of business. Yeah, so let's take a look at that at that stage then. So after those 20 or so years, that successful career, you chose to leave the business world, the power, the money, and go in a completely different direction. You, know, you hear the phrase, uh, golden handcuffs, right, that keep people locked in once they've achieved a certain level of success in the mainstream. So, so why really, what made you bail on the whole thing? What was the turning point? Well, the turning point was my body couldn't handle it anymore. For years, I had been noticing that my attitude was getting worse. My mood was getting worse. My memory was getting worse. I was losing the pleasure in doing my work. But I never realized the cause of this was a disease in my body. I was in pain, but I couldn't feel the pain because I was so out of touch with my body. Eventually, my body just collapsed. I was hospitalized on and off for months. I went on medical disability leave but doctors couldn't really help me. But eventually one doctor said to me, look, you have to change your lifestyle if you want to heal. So I started to try. I think it really all started for me when I went to my first yoga class. It was the first time I ever encountered the concept of feeling the body. For the last decade, I'd been doing everything I could do not to feel the body because it hurt. But when I just slowed down a bit in a yoga class, and tried to feel my body, I was amazed at what happened. And that led to three or four years where eventually nothing else interested me except for health and wellness. I constantly read about yoga, nutrition, herbalism, every kind of alternative medicine. Soon, I started to understand that there's a body-mind-spirit connection, and I started to read everything I could find about spirituality, theology, and all the practices that can help us open up our hearts and minds also. And I wasn't just reading, I was practicing too. I tried all kinds of things, different healing diets, body work, meditation, a lot more. Actually, everything I learned about, I put into practice to see if it could help me in my personal healing process. And I kept the practices that helped, and I dropped the ones that didn't. At that point, I was too deep in it. I knew I could never go back to the corporate world. At that point, it felt completely empty to me. I knew that whatever I do is going to have to build on this passion that I was developing for healing and health practices. Now, that's really fascinating to me that it seems like your own personal process kind of mirrored what you were seeing in the corporate world, which is that fate sort of forced your hand so that you had to tear the whole thing down, the kind of life you were leading, the kind of things you were involved with, and start from scratch again. In the same way that you said that's kind of the only way that big business could ever turn into something that's not bound by its own structures. You know, if you can't do that in the larger institutional context, you were actually able to do that in your own life. Exactly right. We can always tear our own life down and start from scratch again. Not easy, but sometimes it's just the right thing to do. Well, I think that's really encouraging, too, for, for a lot of people who feel disempowered and kind of trapped in those kinds of situations and faced with the, ah, oh, well, you can't change. You can't make a dent in these huge goliaths of momentum in the culture and the government, but you can take total responsibility for yourself and apply all of that to yourself. So let's take a look at that. So this process for you kept going, and it sort of reached – it seems like it reached its, its peak when you met this shaman, the Shuar Ayahuasca shaman. Tell me a little bit about that whole process. How did you meet this person? How did you get involved? What was that like? Well, at that point, I'd spent a few years reading and practicing everything I could related to health and wellness. The more alternative it was, the more interested I was. 
One of the most mysterious things I read about was ayahuasca, the sacred medicine of the shamans of the Amazon jungle. Ayahuasca is a kind of a thick tea. It's made from a mixture of several different Amazon plants. The shamans of that region have been making this medicine and working with it for more than 100,000 years. They consider it sacred, and drinking it is a central part of their healing ceremonies. They call it the vine of the soul. They say it opens the door to the spirit world. They also believe it's a very powerful medicine for physical healing of the body as well, like mending broken bones more quickly or even recovering from flu. I'd read about this, but I thought you had to travel down to the Amazon to experience it. But early in 2008, a friend of mine invited me to come to Amsterdam. He told me there was a shaman from the Schwar tradition who had been coming to Europe at that time for 12 years to hold ayahuasca ceremonies. So I went. It was a three-day ceremony. For three nights, we drank the medicine, and we participated in this ceremony. We'd drink medicine, and we'd sit around this huge, gorgeous fire. The shaman was there with his wife and his son, and they played wonderful music on these instruments that they made by hand from plants just a few hours before the ceremony. They sang songs from the Shuar shamanic tradition. And while this was happening, I had this indescribable, amazing experience. By the end of the weekend, I felt like I had discovered something so precious and so much of value, I just wanted to connect with that as much as possible. And that's why I began to work with this shaman organizing ceremonies with him in Europe. Over time, I became kind of an apprentice, learning how to work with the medicine and the ceremony for healing myself and other people as well. Over the next two years, I was involved in dozens of ceremonies, and we shared these ceremonies with almost 200 people in Europe. So in pursuing this ayahuasca work more and more, what kind of things did you come across in yourself and your idea of the world and your ideas about business and health? What, was it a total shift, a total transformation? It was quite gradual. Every ceremony was a chance to gain a little bit more understanding, to release a little bit more pain. Not a huge lightning bolt, although there were some moments like that too. It was more like a series of baby steps, leading me along a path, somehow leading toward myself. My first priority at that time was still healing the body, so I did a lot of work on that. But I feel this shamanic work went deeper than that. I don't really know how to put what I learned into words, but if I wanted to try, I'd have to use a word like integration or holistic. It's about the little choices we make every day and how we choose to fill our life with meaning or fail to fill it with meaning. Everything we do affects everyone else around us, so we have responsibility. For example, to tie it back to what we were talking about earlier, I can choose to work in a job I hate, doing work that just feels wrong, trying to please my boss, chasing after the next paycheck. Or I can take a risk, and I can do something I really believe in. Whichever I choose, it affects a lot of people, not just me and my family. And, you know, I had all this experience from two decades in the business world that I had rejected because I thought it was dirty, and I was disgusted by what I saw in that world. But I came to understand that it's my own responsibility to make something worthwhile out of my life experiences. I can say it's dirty and throw it all away, but I can also choose to fill that so-called dirty experience with meaning by doing something of value with it. And you know, by the time I was ready to come back from the shamanic work, I felt like a man on a mission. I understood it was my job to clean up my own body and my own life. And I was completely focused on the idea of taking every experience of my life and using it to build something that would allow me to share my value with the world. So even my experience with the dysfunction of mega business, I wanted to transform that into something that could help small, good businesses to achieve super function. I wanted to take basically all the pain that I had experienced and transform that into joy that could somehow be shared with other people. And that's the idea that has driven me ever since that time. Well, that makes total sense. And, you know, sometimes you see people will go so far into the world of, of this sort of alternative healing and transformative practice, but then they'll just stay there. They'll kind of avoid 
life as a refuge. Did, did you find when you were on your way back, when you felt like you had gotten that mission that you were encountering understanding with, with those, uh, the people you were working with and with the shamanism or were they kind of resistant to that? Did they want to kind of keep you in this other world? Very little understanding, Riley. There aren't many people in the shamanic world who understand or respect business. And there's almost no one in the business world who has any idea what shamanic work is about. So it was up to you more or less to kind of bridge those two worlds and see the virtue and, and dangers in both. Yes, and that's what I meant before when I said I'd have to use a word like holistic or integration to describe what I learned. Our culture is split down the middle. We have the world of business and power, but that world is motivated by profit. It's inward looking, and usually it's heartless and often destructive. But then we have the world of the healers, body workers, shamans, artists, those people who dedicate their lives to the expression of something that can make the world a better place. But sometimes they don't have the power to create real change. So ultimately, it seems like choosing to not turn your back on either of these was the, the seed of what has become your business, wellness prosperity systems. So what, what would you say is the, the mission, the purpose of that organization? Wellness prosperity systems is all about reaching out to owners or managers of heart-centric wellness businesses and helping them make the process of running the business more easeful and enjoyable, more profitable, and more effective at helping their clients. We have to rethink the way we do business. We have to find ways to make all the money we need while we're serving others and making the world a better place. We have to create efficient, powerful, and above all, clean methods and tools to get everything done that's needed to be done to make a business run smoothly and to launch it on a growth path. And it has to be easy and fun. The business should be an energy source for the owner, not a drain. So what I do is build systems specifically for wellness businesses. Systems the owner or the manager can implement easily. The systems I build work inside the business and they deliver results and really bring that business up to the next level. It frees up a lot of energy that can then be put into the authentic mission of that particular wellness business whether that's body work or some kind of holistic healing therapy or whatever it is they do. It's a positive cycle. My clients get to touch more people. They get to act as a catalyst for greater healing, and they get to enjoy more success at the same time. Well, I, for one, am very glad that you took this mission on because I, as I mentioned before, I am a coaching client. I'm one of these people who I've worked on I, I have a method of wellness, and it's a not a particularly well-known one. And early on in my life, I kind of did the whole baby with the bathwater thing, turned my back on what I saw to be a corrupt culture. And then now I find myself with this method that's transformed my life, wanting to share it with people and then going, well, hey, how do I do that? And bumping up against dead ends, finally working, Robert, with you, like you said, the business side seems like a burden. It seemed like not only a burden to me, but just an unfathomable depth of mystery where I was totally out of context with what I understood. And now it's become, not only do I feel like, hey, I can do this, and hey, this, this I can actually make this connection with people, it's actually become pretty fun. The strategy, the system building, the seeing how it all fits together, how it's not two different things. It's not two different things. It's one thing. So I, I love that that idea of it being a, your, your holistic project with, with bringing these two worlds together. So, so what kind of what services do you offer for people? Well, I offer a lot of services because running a business involves all kinds of different activities, from marketing to operations to finance and accounting, even legal compliance. And then there's the more intangible side of business, things like innovating new services and finding better ways to build authentic relationships with clients. That said, usually... I begin with marketing because that's where I can make the biggest difference fastest. So when I begin to work with a new client, the first thing I do is put in systems to bring in more new clients, to increase the value of client relationships, and to become a better steward of resources. Once that's in place, it's like a growth engine. But actually, I think the most important service of all is something that I do completely free. It's called the 30-Minute Wellness Business Tune-Up. 
Any wellness business owner can request this, and I don't charge anything for it. We simply get on the phone together, and I give a half hour of free consultation. We talk about the problems and the goals of the business. We talk about what's been done and what hasn't, what works, what doesn't, and new ideas. You know, I could go on and on about different services, but the truth is, even though we don't charge money for this 30-minute tune-up, I feel like it's the most important thing I offer because sometimes new ideas are more powerful than anything. This is a half hour of fresh ideas to just pump some fresh energy into a business, and that can lead to a lot of great things. Well, that's where I started myself, and I can say that even that on its own definitely set me going in what would have been the right direction, even if we didn't start working together. I'm so glad to hear you say that, Riley, because I would love to work with a lot more clients like you. For example, you have this amazing method of self-healing that really needs to be shared with as many people as possible, and you implement the ideas we talk about. So week after week, I can see the energy building in your business And I also see that you're building this powerful foundation. It's like block by block, you're putting in place principles and systems that you're going to be able to build on for many years. So it's a joy to work with you. It's so satisfying to build something that's strong and good. (laughs) Well, it's been my pleasure too. It, It does take time and it does take effort. But having that strong foundation and knowing that it's your foundation, that's the real groundedness. You know, thinking of these mega corporations to governments is sort of the the giants the goliaths and then we've got us little davids running around it seems like the internet and the ability to find each other and communicate with each other and to share skills and to find out what we don't know without having to go through the institutional labyrinth. That's David's slingshot right there. The ability to use these tools to empower the little guy. I mean, this is the time, I feel like this is the time for what you do to really to really blow up and, and for what wellness people do in general. They can find who they're looking for if they, if they just know how. And that's what I'm learning with my own business and uh, learning from you. Yes, this is the time, right now. Amazing new possibilities have opened up. They're opening up right now. It's just what you said. The ability to find each other, to communicate, share skills. I love how you said we're like little Davids running around. And now we have this amazing slingshot. We just need to learn how to use it really well. Yep, it's just slingshot practice. Let's work work on those targets. There you go. All right, Robert. Well, it's a a definite pleasure to talk to you every time. Uh, Thanks for taking the time today. It's, it's, It's been a blast. Riley, it was a pleasure for me as well, as always. Thank you very much. If you're a wellness business owner or manager, a free 30-minute tune-up call with Robert could be a great experience for you. Your business can be more fun, more effective, and more profitable. Just go to wellnessbusinesstuneup.com to get started now. Or call us at 800-430-1567.